We start off with another sharp sell-off to end the week. The Nasdaq dropping nearly 3% to close at the lows of the day. The index now down more than 15% from its record high. And look at the moves across markets just this week. The S&P down more than 5.5%. Treasury yields dropping from multi-year highs. In commodities, the economic recovery trade getting crushed. The S&P mining ETF dropping more than 10%. So what exactly is the market trying to tell us? Today is Sunday, January 23rd. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's dive right into it. In focus tonight. And so it begins. The beginning phase of the upcoming bear market. As you might be aware by now, the Federal Reserve's policy is changing from becoming quote-unquote easing to quote-unquote tightening, meaning the flow of drugs from the Federal Reserve, the flow of coke from the Fed to the market is about to end. And you what I know, we've been talking about this for a long time, that the only thing supporting the stock market to hold these insane valuations right now is the flow of coke from the Fed to the market. You take that away and the rug will be pulled in the most violent fashion you've ever seen. And we're already seeing this happening. The sell-off is absolutely aggressive and stunning and we're just getting started baby but somehow the retail crowd did not get the memo yet the retail crowd has been zombified stripped away from any rationale or critical thinking at all they put the blindfolds on and they continue to buy the dip over and over and over again because your typical retail investor has become a zombified degenerate gambler who's programmed an autopilot to buy the dip over and over and over again and it worked in the past when the fed was easing it's not working anymore yet the retail crowd continues to buy the dip over and over and over again expecting the fed somehow is bluffing even though we have the most intense and destructive inflation that we've ever seen since the 1970s. In late September, the retail crowd bought almost $2 billion worth of dip in the stock market. And they continued to buy the dip over and over and over again in November, in December, and now repeatedly in January, over and over and over again. The difference this time around, they're holding massive bags. We're talking billions and billions of dollars worth of bags. Of course, the corporate insiders, they've already dumped their stock. They cashed in hundreds of millions of dollars, in some cases, billions of billions of dollars. They're done. The insiders are done. The scam already took place. The greatest transfer of wealth in human history is almost done now. They're going to leave the retail crowd holding the bag. And we're talking billions of dollars worth of bags just right now. The few weeks worth of selling produced billions and billions of dollars worth of bags. And these bags are about to be in the trillions. Look no further than the crypto market, aka the tulip market. Over the weekend alone, over a trillion dollars was wiped away. Poof, gone. But are the retail crowd even listening? Of course not. Investors will have their resolve tested should declines become more frequent. In the week through Thursday, they shoved more than $1 billion into technology exchange traded funds, data compliant by Bloomberg Show. In fact, every industry sector except consumer discretionary and materials saw inflow in that four-day stretch. Perhaps you want to buy materials here since we have inflation you want to be in copper and metals, etc. But no, they're buying the same names over and over again. Tech, the EVs, the ARK Invest Mania, over and over and over again. The bags are getting bigger here, folks. The meme stocks, you want to talk about that? Meanwhile, lucky dip buyers added another $500 million to the ProShare Ultra Pro QQQ fund, the ticker T triple Qs. This is the ultra leverage index for the Qs, meaning if the Qs pops higher in a single day by 1%, that T triple Qs will go higher three times the regular Qs and vice versa. 
if the Nasdaq, the triple Qs, goes down 1%, the T triple Qs will go down three times that loss. This is how you know that it's not institutions or the big guys buying the dip here. It is the retail crowd because they're buying leverage indices, the riskiest way to buy the dip. It shows high confidence. It shows complacency. It shows arrogance. And boy, they've been holding massive bags in the T triple Qs. JP Morgan's data showed that the week through Tuesday saw the strongest retail order imbalance, quote unquote, for equities on record, meaning that the buy orders outnumbered sell orders. Investors added a total $5.9 billion, with Tuesday's $1.7 billion flow being the highest single session inflow in history. Unbelievable. They're begging to be slaughtered here, folks. And look at this. The inflows in the T triple Qs. Massive inflows. We're talking billions of dollars here in a matter of weeks. And by the way, this index, the T triple Qs, been around for a long time. You know how many times I used this, be it in options or buying the index straight up? I can count maybe three times in about a decade worth of trading, but the retail crowd continues to buy these leverage indices. And by the way, they also continue to buy the S triple Qs, which is the three times inverse index of the Qs. All high risk plays here, but the retail crowd has a high tolerance for risk. Be it the crypto market, be it the options, mania gambling, but they're about to be taught a painful lesson. It's already happening. It's already underway. Now, when we look at the net retail flows turnover, the options delta, they remain positive, meaning they're buying more and they're betting for more upside. So a lot of you out there say, hey, there is a lot of fear in the market. And when there's fear, you know, the morons, these Robin Hood idiots, oh, they love to misquote Warren Buffett. They don't use any of his teachings when it comes to investing and trading at all. But when the market goes down, they quote Warren Buffett, be greedy when everybody's fearful. Really? Does this look like fear to you? Pouring billions and billions and billions of dollars every single week, buying the dip and getting slaughtered, catching a falling knife? That's not fear. Fear is about to come. Just wait for it. Because despite of all of this buying, it didn't work. And the Nasdaq suffered its worst start of the year since 2008. I wonder what happened back then. Hmm, I can't remember. All bad years, by the way, when we saw such a bad start. 2008, 2016, and now we're set to have the worst start since January of 2008. And look at this. In a regular year, the market pulls back 10 to 15% every single year. That's normal. Not during last year, though. We barely had 5% corrections, sustainable corrections in 2021. Let me help you out here so you can see this clearly. We have trends, the market bottoms, and we form higher lows. So the corrections become less severe over time. And then the trend breaks, and we have another correction. And we start another phase, and then we make higher lows once again, until that's broken, and we start another one. The latest break, however, that started back in December, is different than all of them. We're making lower lows. It doesn't look that this is just a correction, and we're about to make higher lows, and the market's going to recover, and we'll go back to all-time highs again. It looks that we tapped out here. It looks that we are forming the beginning of the bear market, absent of a massive rescue mission, which it cannot foresee without a fundamental change in the macroeconomics outlook, meaning inflation. Without inflation cooling down, the bear market is inevitable. Netflix alone lost 40 five billion dollars in one day once again netflix one of the largest components of the nasdaq and a widely held name in your typical household portfolio it lost 45 billion dollars in a single day and on friday alone if you thought that was bad 45 billion lost this weekend we lost over a trillion dollars in the crypto market alone but it gets even better in the options market easily over one trillion dollars expired worthless because it was option expiration. The majority of options that were due for expiration were calls, upside calls, that became way out of the money due to the correction. And therefore, we did not talk about it on Thursday's video. It becomes irrelevant. All of these trillions are lost now. Poof, gone. Because they bought out of the money calls, believing the Santa rally, which turned out to be a sucker's rally, a bull trap, Oh, we told you that in this channel from the get-go. And what do you know? They get flushed down and trillions are lost. See, the Fed injected trillions and trillions of dollars over the course of almost two years into the stock market. And all it took is just a matter of weeks. We haven't even finished January yet. And we already lost 
trillions of dollars out of all of that fake wealth that the Fed created. Of course, the big sharks, the oligarchs, the Musks, the Bezos, the Zuckerbergs, they all cashed out. They turned the fake money into real money, and they're buying islands and massive real estate all over the place. They're launching themselves into space. And of course, they're amassing a massive pile of cash to buy the dip when it is buyable and scoop up all of these assets that you geniuses bought during the pandemic for pennies on the dollar. Meanwhile, you're going to be holding the bank. And since we're talking technicals right now, here's another ominous sign for the stock market. The VIX curve inverts in time-honored bull signal tied to peak panic. Now, be careful here because this is a double-edged sword. I've been telling you for a few days now, we are looking for a bottom in this market. We're looking for a tradable bottom, meaning the market's going to blast higher by retail investors buying the dip. Combine that with options market activities. You combine that with short covering, we're going to have a massive pop higher. And that pop is going to be another bull trap, absent of a fundamental change in the Fed's policy. But here's the double-edged sword. As you can see, when we look at the spreads between the VIX and the three-month futures, every time we pop into positive readings, it is a signal that perhaps the VIX is topping. And if the VIX tops, it means that the market is bottoming. But be careful, though. And you've got to watch this spread carefully. If it is a peak, and then we see the readings diving down to negative territory again and that means the VIX top and this was just a correction and the market is going to bottom and recover it doesn't mean the market is going to go to all-time highs but it means that we have a bottom that we can trade for now however if we continue to see positive readings consistently for a while between the VIX and the three-month futures then this means it's not just a correction it is more than that and you gotta be careful buying the dip here because historically speaking when we look at the nasdaq composite every time we have a closing in a quote-unquote correction territory meaning below 10 percent below the 200 days moving average we see a recovery one week after the majority of times but after that the correction resumes. We will look at all of these years. You could look at this and say, oh, within three months, the market is going to be higher most of the time. So why not buy the dip right now? Let's take a look at three months, for example. The positive readings happened in the aftermath of the 09 crash. So the market already bottomed at that time. You got to look at years where the NASDAQ composite closes in so-called correction territory from the top, not from the bottom. When we look at these years, they're all negative. 2007 2008 in my hunch is we will bottom we're gonna rebound perhaps for a week or two and then we're gonna face the same scenario of 2007 or three months from now the market is gonna be down not up and hence the entry into bear market territory and if you are still optimistic about the market you want to play by the book and this is of course for investors not traders traders trade whatever up down doesn't matter for investors, the book says you gotta wait three weeks after the NASDAQ closes in correction territory before you start buying. Because when we look at the averages, the probabilities say that after the NASDAQ closes in correction territory, the week after that, and perhaps all the way to two weeks, the market is gonna trade higher. And then after that, we see another dip, perhaps erasing all of the gains from the rebound. And then after that, the market bottoms for real. This is in a bull market scenario. The question is, are we still in a bull market or are we at the peak of the bull market? And for that, we segue to the quote-unquote godfather of technical analysis. And he says the stock market could fall 20% or more, but don't panic. This market really, really did unbelievable for 18 months. And I say, how about you panic? If the market is going to go 20% or more, it's not going to be 20%. You and I know that. If the market goes down 20%, margin calls are going to hit. Or when margin calls hit, it's going to be, oh, about 50%. Prominent market technician Ralph Akampura says the recent bout of market volatility has him uneasy. And now he is forecasting a deeper drop in the market that has already delivered significant bruising to Wall Street in the first weeks of 2022. I didn't really like, or I really didn't like yesterday's action. That wasn't cool, quote unquote, said Akampura. 
in an interview with Market Watch late Friday morning from his residence in Minnesota, referring to an intraday reversal on Thursday. What a nasty one that was. When the Nasdaq Composite Index was up 2.1% at the peak, only the end down 1.3%. That reversal is one for the books. It was the second such reversal for the Nasdaq, and the folks at Bespoke Investment Group said that Thursday's backline marked the first time the Nasdaq Composite erased an intraday gain of 1% or more and closed lower by 1% plus on back-to-back -back days in over 20 years. Wow, that is not climactic activity. That is a reversal pattern, Akampora says, or said, what well, do I care? Akampora, who began his career on Wall Street in 1967. See, you got to listen to these old timers. When they speak they know what they're talking about. But the zombie retail investors, the Gen Zers and the likes, with their blindfolds on, or oh, the boomer, the FUD, what do they know, the boomers, right? They don't know about the future, bro. Everything is the future. Farts in a jar, that's the future. That's the big one. And you and I know that that chick is not farting in a jar. She's paying some nasty dudes who haven't showered for years to fart in a jar for her. And you morons are buying these farts in a jar, paying thousands of dollars, thinking that you're sniffing that girl's farts. What a disgusting bunch of creeps. You deserve what you get. When you finally do the DNA analysis for the fart, and you find out that it came from a 300-pound, ugly, disgusting dude who eats M&Ms all day long. Anyways, the old-timer said that the recent pullbacks are bearish for the outlook in stocks. I lived through too many bear markets, he said via phone, noting that the lengthy bullish run for stocks, which has been primarily fueled by easy money policies from the Federal Reserve to combat uh, the thing, may be coming to a conclusion. And notice how the thing is also coming to a conclusion now. You watch. I'll bet you a million bucks right now that Joe Biden, I would say maximum, marsh, maximum. Now that the jabbing thing did not work and his poll numbers are diving, they're dropping like a rock, the most unpopular president in American history. Watch how fast he's going to reverse policies and say, we cannot live with this thing forever. Come on, man. Come on, man. We got to bring back life to normal. <coughs> Watch how fast now that the wealth transfer is already complete. It's done. Anyhow. If we were honest with ourselves, this market really, really did unbelievable things in the last year and a half, Akampora said. He told Market Watch on Friday that his own sentiment has shifted towards stocks. And this is Akampora. If you had spoken to me on, on Tuesday, excuse me, I would have said that the market is going to correct a decline of at least 10%. And now I'm talking 20% or more, he said, of his expectations for declines in the stock benchmark. Give him three more days, and Mr. Akampora would say 50% or more. So he changed his stance here. He was aiming for a 10% correction. Now he says 20%. By the way, wait till he hear Grantham in a second, but here it is. What's changed for Akampora besides the unsavory intraday action? Question mark. He says that signs that bullish appetite is waning is one reason. And that includes the decline in Bitcoin, which he says isn't an asset that he's a fan of, but does gauge it as good sign of investors' attitude. He says that Bitcoin sentiment has also aligned with technology, suggesting that those assets are more or excuse me, are moving more in tandem. The Nasdaq's breaking down, technology is going to pull us down, and Bitcoin below $40,000 is a significant breakdown for sentiment, Akampora said. Remember, this is the godfather. The market technician also said that he poured over a number of components of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, including American Express, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Honeywell International, and spotted negative weekly chart patterns. So I am a little concerned, he said. Now we are talking. A bare phrase, quote-unquote. One of Akampora's other concerns is that the economy faces stagflation. Da -da -da. Again, you can go back and look at the videos that I made in this channel a year ago when I started talking about stagflation. And by the way, YouTube demonetized my videos and banned them just because I said stagflation. Anyways, a period of rising rates and rising inflation. Stagflation can cause real economies to stagnate or decline and erode purchasing power. Such a scenario could be a years-long dampener on the market's uptrend. And if you thought that was scary, go ahead and grab a new diaper. Matter of fact, make that too. 
because you're going to need it. I'm going to pause and wait for you till you get your diapers. But anyways, here's why you need it. You actually need diapers and good luck because we're all going to need it as the U.S. market approaches the end of the super bubble, quote unquote, says legendary investor Jeremy Grantham. And just a reminder, Jeremy Grantham knew this ahead of time. He predicted exactly how this bubble is going to unfold and how it's going to collapse. Take a listen. 54 uh, in, in, in a month, uh, which is, by the way, a typical precursor of a bubble breaking. If you're looking for the very early warning signs of a bubble breaking, you find the stocks that have done the best, uh, SPACs and, and particular SPACs and Tesla and, and, and uh, Bitcoin, and, and you wait until they start to have these big daily drops, and then they recover and they drop and they recover. Uh, and, and, and that's the very early warning. And the market in 2000, for example, didn't go together. Uh, they took out the pet dot coms and shot them. The rest of the market continued to go up. It, it didn't even deign to notice the shooting of those little guys. They were only worth scores of millions or a couple of hundred million. Then they took out the junior growth stocks and shot them and the market kept going up. And then they took the medium growth stocks and shot them. And, and finally, by the summer, they were shooting the Cisco's and the, the entire tech uh, part of the market had been shot. And that had been 30% at the market peak of the total market cap. And yet the S&P by September was at the co-equal high of March, which meant that the other 70 had continued to rise. So that is a typical way. Bubbles don't necessarily break en masse, but having, having sliced off the tech and, and, and the dot coms, uh, the end, then finally the 70%, like a giant ice, iceberg, rolled over en masse for 70 percent and went down for two and a half years uh, uh, by 50 percent what did we see so far the mania names the small caps the quantum scapes of the world they already crashed and then came the arc invest and then came the software stocks the biotech stocks and then came the SPACs, the ipos Little by little, they're shooting all the mania corners in the stock market. And soon enough, they're going to shoot the big guys. Apple, Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, Tesla. Wait till you see that one. But here's uh, Jeremy Grantham, famed investor who for decades has been calling market bubbles, said the historic collapse in stocks he predicted a year ago is underway. And even an intervention by the Federal Reserve cannot prevent an eventual plunge of almost 50%. So if we say, oh, but Papa Jerome, he's going to save us again. He's just bluffing. Well, Jeremy Grantham says, who gives a shit about Papa Jerome? Whatever he does, the market is going down 50% either way. In a note posted Thursday, Grantham, the co-founder of Boston Asset Manager GMO, describes U.S. stocks as being in a super bubble, quote unquote, only the fourth of the past century. And just as they did in the crash of 29, the dot-com bust of 2000, the financial crisis of 2008, he is certain this bubble will burst, sending indices back to statistical norms and possibly further. It's going to be the latter, and the reason is margin calls. Wait till you see the margin calls tsunami that's about to hit. That, he said, involves the S&P 500 dropping some 45% from Wednesday's close and 48% from its January 4th peak to a level of 2,500. The Nasdaq composite, already down 8.3% this month, may sustain an even bigger correction. I wasn't quite as certain about this bubble a year ago, and I had been about the tech bubble of 2000, or as I had been in Japan, or as I had been in the housing bubble of 2000, said Grantham in a Bloomberg front row interview. I felt highly likely, but perhaps not nearly certain. Listen to this. Today, I feel it is just about nearly certain, Grantham said. This checklist of a super bubble running through its phases is now complete, and the wild rumpus can begin at any time, Grantham said. Who's 83, by the way. 83. And he is sharp as f***. If you think that's impressive, wait till you hear Charlie Munger at 100 years old. Meanwhile, today you have these zombies, the 20-something crowd. They can't even put a coherent sentence together. With all the drugs and the pills, everybody's popping these days. Your brain is already fried by the time you're 40. You're already a vegetable by the time you're 40. Not these old guys. But anyhow, Grantham added, when pessimism returns to the market, we face the largest potential markdown of perceived wealth in U.S. history. Once again, the largest 
loss of wealth in U.S. history. Not for the rich, though, who already cashed out. It could, he said, rival the impact of the dual collapse of the Japanese stock and real estate bubbles in the late 80s. Not only are equities in a super bubble, according to Grantham, there is also a bubble in bonds, the broadest and most extreme quote-unquote bubble ever in global real estate, and an incipient bubble quote-unquote in commodity prices even without a full reversion back to the statistical trend, meaning the mean, he calculates that losses in the U.S. alone may reach $35 trillion. You're going to lose your home. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your savings. And oh, by the way, you're drowned in debt and interest rates are moving higher. Hello, Great Depression 2.0. Grantham pins the blame for bubbles of the past 25 years, mostly on bad monetary policy. Ever since Alan Greenspan was the Fed chairman, he argues, the central bank has aided and abated, quote-unquote, the formation of a successful, of successful bubbles, excuse me, by first making money too cheap and then rushing to bail out markets when corrections followed. Why? Because the Federal Reserve is an entity that doesn't work for the average American. It's an entity designed to make the rich richer. Their main mandate is to prop up, inflate, preserve, and protect the assets of the wealthy stocks and real estate until it gets too large and the wealthy grabs the phone and say, hey, Mr. Jerome Powell, enough is enough. Wage inflation is getting higher. We're not going to pay these bums more. We already cashed out. We sold our mansions, our real estate portfolios, our stocks. We want to see the crash so we can scoop it all again at a cheaper price. And then we become the bailer. The government, the citizens, even the Fed have to go down on their knees and beg Elon Musk and Bezos and the rich fat cats to bail out the economy by buying assets. And that would create even more concentration of wealth than before. But anyhow, everything has consequences. And the consequences this time may or may not include some interactable inflation, Grantham said. Or writes, who cares? What do I care? Writes or says. But, and this is Grantham again. It has already definitely included the most dangerous breadth of assets overpricing in financial history. Here's the man in his own words. The trend line being slightly generous is 2,500. And most of the great bubbles, the super bubbles, go below trend and stay there for quite a while. Uh, in the Greenspan era, that tendency stopped. In 2000, yes, the Nasdaq came down 82%, which was fairly brutal. Amazon came down 92 But the Federal Reserve raced to the rescue so loudly and strongly that they stopped the decline in the S&P at trend line. It only declined 50%. 50% is a hell of a big decline, uh, but it was only enough to get it back then to trend. This time, trend is at most 2,500. And I would expect, even if the Federal Reserve tries to do the same, it will be hard to prevent the market from declining to that level. And he's not alone, by the way. Even Morgan Stanley's Slimmon, who is the top portfolio manager at Morgan Stanley, warns against buying growth stock dip. And here he is. Look at him laughing. <laughs> I make more money than you do. <laughs> How much you want to bet that I'm beating this guy's ass? Not just year to date, but even last year. I'm not Morgan Stanley, I'm not Goldman Sachs, I'm not Harvard, I'm not Yale. I'm just the guy from the street who happens to like stocks. We also have Carlisle Rubenstein, and he says we are due for a correction, quote-unquote. And he says that conveniently, of course, after dumping hundreds of millions of dollars worth of CG stock. I don't want to do the math. Please do it for me. Add the numbers and let me know how much he dumped all in all. Big number. Anyhow, we're moving on to cover the market information for the week. Let's start with the performance. And here we go. On Friday, the Dow Industrial Average was down by almost 450 points or a decline of 1.30%. The Nasdaq was down 385.10 points or a decline of 2.72%. The S&P 500 down by 84.79 points or a decline of 1.89%. And what about the sector's performance on Friday? Down across the board, no medals given at all. The laggards on Friday 
were led by communication services, cyclicals, and materials. Let's contrast that with the weekly performance of the sectors down across the board, even energy is down. And again, the losses, the declines were led by cyclicals, technology, and communication services. Awful week, all in all. What about the advanced decline ratios on Friday? NYSE, 16% advancing versus 80% declining. NASDAQ, 16% advancing versus 80% declining. Folks, when you see these exaggerated ratios to the downside, you know the deal. I am smelling a rebound. It's going to happen. And my bet is it's going to happen this week. It doesn't matter what Jerome Powell is going to say. Everybody's looking for a rebound. Any hint of quote unquote good news, meaning easing in the monetary policy, I don't expect at all that Jerome Powell is going to say, oh, you know what? The market is down 10%, so we're going to back off. But he might say something that he has already said before, which is we're going to be data driven. And then the market says, oh, he's going to be data driven. And this week we got whatever indicator that was down. So inflation is easing and perhaps Jerome is not going to be as hawkish. They're going to make up the excuse after the fact. So again, the point being is we are looking for a rebound. We're not going to bet on it ahead of time. Let the market show you where the bottom is. Moving on to futures. What's going on here? Crude oil prices retreated on Friday just slightly, down about 1% for the WTI and about half a percent for the Brent. Likewise, gasoline prices are down by almost 1%. On the other hand, heating oil is up about half a percentage point and natural gas once again up four percent perhaps crawling its way back to four bucks we continue to watch natural gas due to the tensions between russia and ukraine by the way the germans are caught in the middle and it's not really russia and ukraine it's russia and the united states and germany caught in the middle and you heard what the navy officer or the navy minister whatever the hell he is in germany with the comments and then he resigns right after we're going to talk about all of that when we talk about the wall of worry and russia but let's talk about the domestic market when it comes to natural gas because the worry was, and it still is, by the way, what if we get a freeze, a deep freeze in Texas once again? We almost had one, by the way, because the supply of natural gas is dropping down. We have pipeline companies threatening to cut off gas supply to Texas' biggest power generator. And we're seeing Texans, lovely people, I'm sure, are stockpiling firewood in fear of another big freeze. Because if it happens, it's going to be another disaster here. Temperatures dropped last week, and then they recovered again. And it wasn't really that bad. But who's to say that we're not going to have another massive drop in temperatures in February? This winter season is still young. Back to the futures, lumber in softs continues to ease. It was at around 1300 not so long ago. And on Friday, it was down almost 4%. Likewise, coffee was down, cotton, cocoa, all down. Well, we have... OJ and sugar pretty much in the flat line. Metals, giving away some of the gains, we're seeing silver down, platinum down, copper down, yet we have palladium shooting up higher by over 1%. Palladium with the tensions, Russia, Ukraine. Russia happens to be one of the biggest suppliers of palladium in the globe. Yet gold remains muted. And this is why I continue to like gold. It's moving steady eddy. No impulsive moves higher. Gains of 5%, 6%. It's not happening in gold. But we're seeing gold quietly and steadily moving higher. Even with the dollar moving higher. And even with the 10-year yield blasting and overshooting higher. Gold continues to hold. A matter of fact, continues to move higher. What about meats? Modest losses for both live and feeder cattle futures. On the other hand, lean hogs. The new big tech, I'm telling you, is up again almost 2% on Friday alone. But what about grains? We're seeing gains for corn and rough rice, muted activities for soybean oil and canola, yet we have losses for oats, wheat, soybeans, and soybean meal. Let's talk a little bit about soybean meal because we got losses on Friday and here's the reason. We know that soybean meal is used as animal feed and biofuel, whatever. The exports are surging higher according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we're having a slight boost in supply, and this is pushing prices down for a little bit, at least on Friday. Yet the boost in supply comes hand-in-hand -hand with a boost in demand from Spain, the Philippines, other Asian countries, all of them looking fat in cattle and hogs and other animals, whatever they eat, 
doesn't matter to me, but the demand remains high, and therefore watch out how fast they're gonna buy the dip in soybean meal. When it comes to grains, the good news is that fertilizer prices are moving down, and this is wholesale prices. I don't know if you can see this chart, it's not clear, it's a little blurry, but the blue line is wholesale prices for urea, white is the retail prices for urea. Now, as you can see, while wholesale prices went down, retail prices continue to climb higher. And we've seen this phenomenon with lumber, by the way. The commodity lumber prices went down big. Yet the retail price that you and I pay when we go to Home Depot did not go down by much. So you have to factor that in. Why are prices lingering higher for retail? I would say price gouging. I would say inflation expectations. They can get away with it so long as the consumer continues to pay higher, expecting that, yeah, the price is higher because inflation. But they're not aware that the commodity price itself went down. So watch out here when you assume that inflation is down because a certain commodity went down in price. You gotta look at the retail prices too. We have another problem when it comes to grains and farmers because they're revolting against deer. And the reason is deer has certain restrictions on how you repair these equipments. If you repair them on your own, not following the guidelines, you could lose the warranty, etc., etc. So the farmers are saying, oh, wait a minute here, you're changing the rules, we can fix the equipment, but you can avoid the warranty because you want to juice us for maintenance fees. And if farmers pay more in maintenance fees, well, they're going to charge more. They're going to factor that in when they sell their products. And in doing so, food prices will continue to move higher. The most stunning part of this inflation right now, forget about energy. Energy was last year. Right now, it's food prices. The move in meats, in grains, in bread prices, in flour, even in frozen food. Unbelievable move. And it's causing a massive backlash from the consumer against the administration. And hence, the administration is adding pressure on the Fed to reverse the easy money policy. Moving on to options, the big casino, what's going on here? On Friday, the hottest table by far remains Apple. Look at the volume, it's picking up. In my conditions of the so-called bottom that we're about to trade, few conditions have to happen first. From the 10-year yield pulling back, this is already happening. And then we have the VIX pulling back, that has yet to happen. And we also need to see buying on higher than average volume, buying the dip, that has yet to happen. And another condition is a recovery in the options market volume, specifically buying calls. If all of these conditions are met, then we have a tradable bottom. Now, what did we see on Friday? Options volumes are recovering. They're moving higher. Now, that could be due to options expiration on Friday. But we gotta wait and see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as we get closer to the FOMC and the conference from Powell. We need to see the options volume recovering specifically for calls. Anyhow, on Friday, the hottest table by far was Apple at around 1.8 million contracts exchanging hands. About 52.5% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, the souffle. With around 1.1 million contracts, about 48% of those were calls. And at number three, AMD. With about 655,000 contracts, about 30, excuse me, 53.5% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. How about the ticker IWM for the Russell 2000? They're buying puts here, the 187 puts for the expiration date, January 28th with expectations the IWM will drop down by more than 5% by then. They paid about one buck and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about five million dollars. And what about the trade for the ticker T triple Q's? We talked about this in the beginning of the video. Retail crowd, they love this one. They buy the T triple Q's all the time. And they continue to buy calls and they continue to hold the bag. In this case, they're buying the 67 calls for the expiration date. January 28th, meaning this upcoming Friday, with the expectations that the T triple Qs could pop higher by more than 18% by then. By the way, this time around, it could work. I'm also expecting a rebound. Anyhow, they paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $1.2 million. What about the trade for the ticker XLF, the financial ETF, their buying puts? Interesting. The 32 puts for the expiration date, April 14th. With expectations, the name could drop down by more than 16% by then. They paid about 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $900,000. What about the trade for the ticker LVS Las Vegas Sands? 
a pop tire after the regulations in Macau were changed or about to change, whatever it is, it was a short squeeze. But here we have somebody betting that the short squeeze is over and the pain will resume in LVS. They're shorting the rip by buying the 40 bucks puts for the expiration date February 18th, with the expectations that LVS will drop down by 8.5% or more by then. They paid about 1 buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about 2.4 million dollars. And what about the trade for the ticker NVDA NVIDIA? If we have a rebound this week, this name will lead the rebound along with RKK and the oversold names, the beaten down names. In this case, they bought the 250 calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, January 28th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 7% by then. They paid about 3 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $5.8 million. What about the trade for the ticker XLC, the communication ETF, communication services, I'm sorry. This is the ETF for communication services, AT&T, Verizon, Google, Facebook, Viacom, Netflix, etc. It is a cheap way to bet against these names. For example, if you bet against Netflix right now, the premiums are through the roof. But betting on that via buying puts on the XLC instead is a little cheaper. In this case, they're buying the 67 puts for the expiration date, February 18th. With expectations that the name could drop down by more than 7% by then, they paid all about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker AMC for, you guessed it, AMC? Once AMC lost 21 as support, it's over. The floodgates open and the shorts are piling in. They're smelling blood, ape blood, and they're piling in on the misery of the apes. And the apes are bailing out, by the way, despite the hashtags not leaving all that garbage. They're dumping. In this case, they're buying the 17 puts for the expiration date, February 11th, with the expectations that AMC could drop down by more than 5.5% by then. And they paid about a buck and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $2 million. Lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker ADI for analog devices? Lots of put options buying on this name, but be careful because the spreads are too wide. You're better off picking another name if you're betting against chips. But regardless, they continue to buy puts on ADI, in this case the 150 puts for the expiration date February 18th, with expectations that the name would drop down by more than 6% by then. They paid about 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here on Friday? Bloodbath across the board, very few names lighting up in the green. I can see certain consumer defensives like Procter & Gamble, Mondelez, I've owned Mondelez for a long time now, it continues to perform in this environment. Mondelez is the kind of stock you want to be in when you have market route and the Fed is tightening. It's an excellent name, high cash flow, high dividend, and it continues to move higher. Likewise, Hershey's. I shared with you a trade about Hershey's a few weeks ago, buying calls, perhaps I'm going to add it to the portfolio, we'll see. We also talked about UNP. Union Pacific also moving higher on Friday, along with Abbott Laboratories. Now, we have another name that I'm highly optimistic about. Perhaps I'm going to add it to my personal portfolio this year. It's Honda HMC, the only name lighting up green on Friday among the auto manufacturers. All of them moved higher, with the exception of Honda. Honda is cheap, cheap, cheap right now. The problem with this company is they have yet to share their EV plans, which makes it a hurdle on face value. But remember what I did in 2020, 2021, by the end of the year, 2020, I was holding GM. GM moved higher. And I told you back then, I'm going to rotate from GM to Ford because Ford has yet to get the bump from the EV optimism, EV stampede, whatever you want to call it. And that was the right call, because in 2021, GM stalled while Ford blasted higher. If my prediction is right, and Honda, all they have to do is dump some ideas, some future prospects of an EV. Who cares if they're actually going to produce an EV or not? Just juice these donkeys for whatever pennies they have left, and Honda will outperform GM, Ford, Toyota, the rest of them. Certain chips moving higher, Texas, but all in all, a bloodbath on Friday. Let's contrast this with the picture from the week. This is the weekly heat map. It gets even worse. We're seeing severe losses here for the week, with the exception of energy. When we talk about energy, it's really Exxon, not even Chevron performing. 
It's just Exxon. Activision Blizzard, EA, you know the story, the acquisition by Microsoft. And then we have Pindudu, JD, the Chinese names, Gold, also green for the week. Then we have Procter & Gamble on the heels of their earnings. We already covered that. And look at this, Mondelez, MDLZ, Hershey's, still green for the week. At some point, they're all going to get whacked. But where would you rather hide? In big tech? Software? Chips, banks, even banks are not safe. I'd rather hide in these consumer brands, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, Clorox, Mondelez, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo. These are the names I want to hide in right now. Moving on to the heat map analysis for the ETFs. Let's see what's going on here for the week. Everything is down, energy down, utilities down, tech down, healthcare down. Everything is down with exception of the inverse indices, the TZA, the SQQs, the SDC, the SPXS, the VIX proxies, VXX, UVXY, and that's pretty much it. It didn't matter whether you're betting on growth or value. Both of them got whacked this week, which could be a so-called reset week, meaning a bottoming week, meaning we could rebound next week. We'll see. But also in the green, in the ETF heat map, gold, the GDX, the GDXG all moving higher. We also have silver, SLV moving higher. And among international ETFs, once again, my recommendation, the EWZ continues to outperform. Moving on to charts, we start with the SPY, the S&P 500, a 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? On Friday, the market opened down and it appeared that it was somewhat recovering. That was another bull trap. It was a mere reverse ABC pattern. And the chart from that point on flushed down all the way till the end of the day. Ugly closing. When you see closings like this, it is an indicator that perhaps the following day, in this case Monday, will also be a painful day, at least in the morning. Now hold your horses here because we're going to talk about the dip, the bottom, what do you buy when you close in the NASDAQ. But in the SPY, the support right now, we went down all the way to 438. We lost 447. We lost 443. Now we're down at 438. We're getting close to oversold readings. And here is a daily chart for the SPY's futures. Again, the bears are in total command. The selling is happening in higher than average volume, way higher than average. The problem is it could be a contrarian indicator. When the selling happens on extreme volume, it could be an indicator that we are bottoming. The problem is what could explain the surge in volume is options expiration over three and a half trillion dollars on Friday alone. We'll look at the momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD, the bears are still in charge. We have negative divergences in both, but look at the RSI. It is getting closer to quote unquote oversold reading. We stopped on the chart at around 4,384 and a half, which was my support line. Could it be, could it be that this is the line that's gonna produce the rebound higher? We'll see, but I would be more confident if we open down on Monday, gapping down big all the way to 4,232, and we see extreme oversold readings on the hour side. If that happens, I'm going to buy the dip with both hands. And before we visit the queues, let's revisit the trade, the short trade that I initiated back in Christmas. Take a look. Let's follow up on a trade that I had right after Christmas, or before Christmas, I should say. I said that I'm buying puts on the queues or initiating a short trade at around 397. So batch number one happened at 397. What do you know? The queues moved higher. And then we had the pattern, the resistance, making lower highs. On the third lower high, it became evident to me that we will visit 397 sooner or later again. So I initiated batch number two for that particular trade, buying more puts. Batch number three will take place if we have a confirmation of a rejection at 397, meaning if the queues open down tomorrow, far away from 397, they will know right away that the chart got rejected from 397 and therefore I will initiate batch number three and that will complete the trade and we will wait till expiration date which happens to be March. Now in all likelihood the trade will be closed before March the expiration date if we see a flush down in the queues. But this is how you construct the trade on increments because you'll never get the timing right. So you have to open your trades on increments and this is exactly how I do it. So here's the update. 
We're now down at 351. We pierced below 352, which I tweeted about beforehand, that with this collapse, perhaps we're going down to 352. We're not oversold yet on the 30 minutes chart, but boy, it's getting extreme here. I am looking to close that short trade that I initiated at 397. Every time I consider closing it, the NASDAQ continues to flush down, so I keep the trade as is. But on Monday, if we open gapping down 100%, I'm going to close the short trade and I'm going to initiate a long trade. Let's see if 352 holds. In all likelihood, if we gap down, it's not going to hold. But let's see what other levels we can look at from a daily chart perspective. And for that, we move on to the continuous contract for the NASDAQ, a daily chart. We are now at 14,445, which is a solid support line. It should hold. I don't see why it wouldn't hold. But you got to remember this. In a flush down scenario, in a mass exodus scenario, they're not going to respect the support lines. They're going to pierce through all of these support lines. But it gets extreme at some point where you get a bounce from some level. And 14,445 held support multiple times before and produced big bounces in the Nasdaq's chart. It is certainly stronger than 15. 000. It is way stronger than 15,500. When you look at the momentum indicators, the bears are still in charge, negative divergences in both, yet we're getting closer to an oversold reading. So we are expecting and anticipating a rebound here, a rebound rally for days, for weeks. And once that becomes overbought, we're going to short again. You look at the volume, the volume is spiking higher. The explanation could be options expiration, but yet this is another sign that the bears remain in charge. And if we do gap down on Monday, date, meaning tomorrow, I'm looking at 14,000. And if that happens, I'm going to cover my shorts and I'm going to go long. And whatever happens, happens. And folks, please, I'm talking about trades. I'm not talking about my investment portfolio. My investment portfolio remains as is. I'm talking about my trading portfolio. And here's a 30 minutes chart for the IWM. Got close to my number, 196.5. It closed slightly above that. Could it go down 196.5 in the morning and then rebound from that point on? It could. It could even pierce below that. We're now waiting for the charts to show us the bottom. We're not going to jump the gun beforehand buying calls or buying the dip. We got to wait till the conditions are met. A rebound on higher than average volume. The VIX cooling down. The 10-year yield cooling down. And the options volume rebounding higher again. The problem is, even if all of that happens and the rebound takes place, look at the weekly chart for the RUT, the Russell 2000. Any rebound is an opportunity to sell. You wait for it a few days, a few weeks, until it's finished. And then you short again. In this case, the RUD, the Russell 2000, lost the 2100 line, the most important line. Let's say this week, this upcoming week, we get a rebound all the way to retest 2100 as resistance. If it fails, then this will be a sign to short again. And all in all, the macro outlook, the Russell, has turned bearish. It made the false breakout from the consolidation range and then retreated. This is an ominous sign signaling that the real breakout will happen in the opposite direction, meaning to the downside, that has been already confirmed by the weekly closing below 2100. It means the Russell is toast. If the Russell is indeed a leading indicator, then the entire market is toast. It's over, folks. We're just going to play rebounds here. But the trend all in all has shifted from bullish the bearish. And here's the daily chart for the Dixie, the dollar index. What's going on here? It is forming what it appears to be for now a bull flag pattern, indicating that the Dixie wants to recapture 96 as support. The momentum indicators are still in negative divergence, but they are bottoming and recovering, curling up higher. If I'm reading the tea leaves right, the Dixie could pop higher again, perhaps on the heels of some commentary from Jerome Powell, who knows? But the technicals are now getting positive. Slide positive for the Dixie. Moving on to gold, still holding at around 1,835. Let's see how well gold is going to hold when the Dixie pops higher. If it holds good, then you have your answer. Gold is reversing the sensitivity against the US dollar. And this would serve as a bullish signal for gold. Here's the daily chart for the 10-year yield. It moved down, yet the Nasdaq continues to collapse. It is too elevated for now. We're still trading above 1.7. But look at the MACD, look at the RSI. They're all pulling back. We could see a more aggressive pullback here in the 10-year yield, perhaps all the way to 1.7, then maybe forming the head and shoulder, and then it goes all the way down to 1.55. I don't know. I'm just reading the tea leaves for you. But if the trajectory is right, the 10-year yield could pull down all the way to 1.7, perhaps below that, and then consolidate for a little while. And the consolidation alone, a cooling down in the volatility in the 10-year yield, will be good for the NASDAQ 
and the rest of the stock market to catch a rebound rally. What about a weekly chart for the TLT? What's going on here? Catching support for 1.40, excuse me, 140, and it is a good looking candle for the week. Now, could the TLT run a retest all the way to 149 as resistance and then it gets rejected from that point on? We see what it appears to be an A, B, C pattern, the C leg all the way down 134 and a half. I don't know. Once again, I'm just reading the tea leaves for you. If that scenario happens, the TLT rebounding all the way to 149, then perhaps the 10-year yield will ease a little bit, and this will initiate the relief rally in the NASDAQ. And then once the TLT gets rejected from 149 and pulls down again, that will be the sell-the-rip opportunity in the NASDAQ, of course. But here's the problem for the market so far. The VIX remains highly elevated. Here's a four-hours chart for the VIX. Look at the MACD indicator, which we've been using for a while. It is moving higher. We're seeing green impressions in the histogram. The columns are getting larger and larger, indicating strength in the momentum for the VIX. And if the VIX is about to move higher and it hasn't topped yet, it means that the SPY, the stock market, hasn't bottomed yet. You gotta watch this chart like a hawk. Because once the VIX tops and it starts to trend down, you'll know right away. You look at the 10-year, it's down. You look at the options volume moving higher. You look at the buying volume of the dip also higher. You put two and two together and you know we are at the bottom. Absent of that, if the VIX continues to move higher, we haven't found the bottom yet. Now, what about the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ? Four hours chart, still moving higher. The MACD remains positive. It is accelerating in strength, meaning we're not over yet. We're not done here with the pop in the VXN. And therefore, we're not done with the flush down in the NASDAQ until and unless the VXN starts to show some signs of topping. We're not going to be ready to buy the dip in the NASDAQ. And let's review what I said about the VXN just a few days ago from the weekly chart perspective. And here's a weekly chart for the VXN. We've already broken the sloping line of resistance and now we're retesting that line for support. What does that mean? the support is confirmed, we're going to see a massive pop in the VXN, which will mean a massive drop in the NASDAQ. And here it is, it popped higher, it caught support from the trend line and it popped higher. And this is the ominous sign for the NASDAQ. Let's say the VXN pulls back again and retouches the trend line for support, the sloping line for support once again. That action will come hand in hand with a pop in the NASDAQ. The problem is, all in all, we have broken that sloping, descending line of resistance to the upside. This is a massive change. It means even if the VXN moves down to retag that support, eventually it's going to move higher. We have another massive pop to happen in the VXN. And therefore, whatever rebound we get for now, all indicators are pointing out that this rebound will be transitory. What about Apple, a daily chart falling back inside the channel, as we predicted, by the way. And of course, the big bomb will happen if earnings from Apple come out disappointing. And if that happens, we're going down all the way to 150 as support. We have some soft support at around 158, but that's not significant at all. The next solid support is around 150. And here's a 30 minutes chart for Tesla. The souffle lost the support once and for all of 95. It knocked once, it knocked twice, third time, fourth time, and that was it. The floodgates open and 995 is no longer support. We are now looking to close the gap at 993. Let's say the chart of Tesla gaps down in the morning and then it recovers. That will do the job in closing the gap of 993. And it will also serve as a bullish indicator to buy Tesla at least all the way till earnings. If you see a big gap down and then a recovery midday, you buy Tesla all the way till earnings. It's going to report next week and then you dump it right away as a trade because you cannot really predict how the market is going to react to earnings. Even if the earnings come out pristine, the bar just moved a lot higher. And lastly, what about BTC tulips? What a beating. Ooh, over the weekend massacre, we talked about the bear flag at around 42,000. The chart was asking any buyers, any buyers, any buyers. The buyers did not show up, so it flushed down. Perhaps 35,000 is a better price. We'll see. The chart is getting oversold from a daily chart perspective. It could go a lot lower. Now, if it goes down to 30,000, then I'm going to buy it as a rebound play. But the drop all the way to 30,000 is ominous within itself because it serves as a notice that the sentiment in the market specifically from retail has soured significantly and without retail participation who's going to push the market higher the insiders who just dump stocks no they're waiting for the crash they're not going to buy right now fortune favors the brave lastly let's move on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow 
We have important data from the Market Manufacturing PMI and the Services PMI, all important readings specifically when it comes to inflation. But the main event remains the FOMC minutes and the conference by Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve's boss. And with that, folks, we have reached the end of the video. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.